Well, hello everyone and welcome again to Painless Universal Conversation with myself and Raj. Today we're talking about the pain of fashion. And when I mean the pain of fashion, we all might all wonder what does this truly mean? It's how do we change, change our mindset to protect our environment for our kids, our grandchildren and our future generation that will live this earth for. My guest is doing just that. She's talking about the sustainability of our clothes. How can we reuse our clothes and find joy in our clothes and own it? Not just buy your clothes for something that will discard over over time, but something that we'll reuse and make it our own. So it lasts longer. My guest is Osola de Castro. She's an internationally recognized opinion leader in sustainable fashion. Her career started as a designer with the pioneering upcycling label from somewhere, which she launched in 1997 until 2014. Her designer collaboration included collections for Jigsaw, Speedo, and all best selling capsule collection for, for Topshop from 2012 to 2014. In, 20, in 2016, she co founded the British Fashion Council Initiative at the London Fashion Week, where she co-created it until 2014. In 2013, with Curry Summers, she founded Fashion Revolution, a global campaign with participation in over 90 countries around the world. She'll be talking about fashion revelation and what it means. Oscala is a regular keynote speaker and a mentor to many designers. She's also an author. We ask her about her book called Love Clothes Loss. Very interesting book, which I encourage everyone to read. She will tell us what it means, why she wrote this book, what message you could gain from reading this book. I am super excited for this conversation as a fashion lover myself. How can I be more sustainable with what I buy so I can protect not just the environment, but protect people who are working in this sector, especially people who are working in the very, very difficult parts of this sector, the beginning phase. Meet my amazing guest, Oscala, as she shares her story. Well, hello everyone and welcome again to Pain This Universal so Conversation with myself and Marsh. As I said in the introduction, today's conversation is really about fashion. Are you a fashion geek? You always think about your clothes, but not particularly paying attention to the pain that fashion could bring. When I wanted to have this conversation today, I was thinking, what is fashion pain? What kind of pain can people go through with that their fashion? Is it from the fat pain of wearing the clothing or is it from the pain of the sustainability or is it from the pain of logistics? We'll be talking about all of this today. My guest, Osala, she is renowned for her work. She's internationally recognized fashion designer and an author. She'll be telling us about why she started her organization, which we'll be talking about shortly, what it means and what we can all do together to start thinking about fashion, our clothes in a different way. How are you? I'm super well and I'm really, really happy to be here. So thank you so much for inviting me. I'm honored. I am honored because I'm a lady myself. I love clothes. So I'm one of those fashion victims in terms of I would buy clothes. But one thing I try and stay away from is the fast clothes. If I buy something, and even if it's cheap, and I think, okay, I might not be able to reuse it, I always find a reason to keep it because I always think, why well, should keep this thing? But before we get started into all of this, because we have so much to talk about, tell me about who are you? <laughs> who am I? So, well, I guess in terms of definition, I would like to put certain things before others. And above all, I am a mother of four and a grandmother of two. And that is really warms the cockle of my heart. That is the first thing that I can say about myself because it's a, it's a loving and lovely family. I am also a recovery fashion designer, I would say. That was my primary uh, career for a long time. And it led to all of my experimentation. I am a mentor. 
I am a curator, I am an author, and I am the co-founder of an amazing organization called Fashion Revolution, which came about as a result of the Rana Plaza disaster in 2013. So we're nearly 10 years old. We'll be 10 years old next year. Oh, wow, that's really fantastic. When you look at your childhood growing up, you talk a lot about fashion. I know your your big thing of who you are is definitely your being a mother and a grandmother. But you talk a lot about fashion. Fashion has led you on the path you are today. Yes. What was your childhood like growing up? Because I always wonder when I see people into fashion, what led you on this path? Um, the the getting inside fashion was 100% accidental, although, I mean, I was one of those. I can't remember anything about my childhood practically that it didn't involve me wearing very, very weird clothes. I mean, I dressed up, I dressed up, I dressed up, and then I dressed up. And I'm a clothes butcherer by nature because, you know, the second I was taught how to use this, which is a crochet needle, yes. I started changing my clothes while I was in school, you know, sort of like making it a little bit longer there, an embellishment over here. Let's do a crochet hole, you know, a, a little flower around a hole. So that was really what I wanted to do. And my journey has been accidental in terms of then actually turning my fashion into a career. But I guess what was always present in me was one, a sense of wanting to make things my own and thinking my own way. And I was born and raised in Italy. Now, Italy, since I guess the Alessandro Michele of these worlds is a much more um, individualistic place. But when I was growing up, everybody wore the same clothes and they were really not the clothes that I wanted to wear. So believe it or not, I was bullied for the clothes I wore, not big bullying, but certainly remarked upon for wearing certain things and not others. And um, I've always believed that fashion is not just how we cover ourselves, but it's how we present ourselves. And for me, fashion is a huge vehicle of thought. So you, you, know, you mentioned I'm a grandmother. Well, my granddaughter wears the same dresses that I wore when I was growing up. So that really is the answer to your question. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love that. <laughs> it's, 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 it's something, I, it's good you said that because a lot of us just think when we look at our clothes today, we don't think we could actually pass them down because we don't buy things that are quite sustainable. So they're not even yeah. long lasting. And they're not even things you could even think of passing down to your daughter, let alone your granddaughter. So that's really yeah. amazing to study, see. You took part in your first group exhibition of drawing in Rome and Venice, in Rome and Venice, at just 15 years of age. What did you learn from being at this exhibition? Well, why did you decide so young to do take part? Well, you know, my mother is a well-known artist in Italy and she runs this wonderful place called the Scuola Internazionale di Grafica in Venice. So I was, to a certain extent, born with certain skills. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my memories of my childhood are living, you know, in my mother's study, in studies of other, you know, uh, artists. And so I really breathed this uh, creativity. And when I was young, I mean, I wasn't, I was good at certain subjects at school, not all of them, but drawing was one of the ones where I excelled. So I did start my life mm -hmm. as a, uh, a printmaker, as an illustrator, but you know what's interesting is that even in that very first show and in others I had later on of my drawings in, in the mid 80s, the emphasis was clothes. So, you know, everything I doodled, everything I drew was either textile inspired or clothing inspired. So I've never really considered myself an artist. I am extremely proud to be a designer because I believe that designers are the people that look for solutions and I am very much in love with the concept of applied art and craft which is 100% what fashion is to me and how I put myself within this profession. Fashion is also a business. That's one, one thing people don't realize. We all think yeah. that fashion is just, okay, you wear your clothes, you look beautiful, you get the wrong way. But we don't see the other side, the business side. Was there any mentor in particular that led you on this achieving the success you had so early on? 
No, not really. So when I started from somewhere, in fact, I would say it was the opposite. I came out with an idea that I wanted to reuse what and what people didn't want. So whether it was secondhand, whether it was literally sweeping the luxury factories um, in the north of Italy, where I'm from near Venice, to reuse all of that you know, mess, I'll probably, I can find little bits and pieces, you know, like, this is probably some beautiful piece I found in the rubbish. And nobody believed, apart from the people that worked in the factories as workers, nobody really believed that this was something that would make business sense. And to be honest with you, I am not a brilliant business person from a practical perspective. I'm a born entrepreneur. Um, and I'm absolutely brilliant at seeing, well, not absolutely brilliant, let's not be so vain. I'm good at, um, but spotting new ideas. And, and that is something that I, I've proved capable of. But it took me a long time to prove that what I was doing had any business sense because it was so close to the fact that it had so much environmental and social sense. Mm -hmm. So my clothes were produced in a local um, social cooperative in Italy by people who had worked in the fashion industry, but because of either physical or emotional difficulties, they couldn't continue. So they were my workers. So everything that I did was also to help others to clean up the waste. And to be honest with you, in 2001, 2002, I started in 97, but people didn't think that this was going to make any business sense whatsoever. So the few people that believed in me, such as Anna Orsini in the British Fashion Council, who brought me in and I've been working with the BFC ever since, really were important in my formation. Uh, partly because I could trust them to be as sort of mentally imaginative as potentially I was, but, but also that they could, they had the patience to wait for the future. You know, vision is nothing else but patience. So I knew that eventually upcycling and reusing, there was going to be a marriage between the environmental need mm -hmm. to leave no waste, the environmental need to produce adequately rather than excessively. I knew that that would make business sense. And it's only now that I see all of these young designers doing it super successfully that I realized I was pioneering. But when I was actually pioneering, I, I, I didn't think it was gonna, I didn't think it was gonna happen. It really was a passion and a belief. Also, love, thank you so much for that because this is truly what you started because you truly believed in something. And it's also something that, it's not just you believe in it, you found ways to turn clothes, old clothes into something more usable. And I think this is something I love about your work. You've, you, you just don't look at clothes. You, you're trying to tell us, change our mindset as well teaching us from yeah. the very earliest early on stage is how do we change our mindset that we see a clothes that we want to convey that we could see potential in it yes when did you absolutely realize that problem the fast fashion in the industry when did you start start realizing there's a problem here we have this fast fashion desire well to be honest with you i don't sort of separate fast fashion from uh, any mainstream fashion. I mean, you know, the, the, the truth is, I'm not so much one for speaking about statistics because I'm not great with numbers, but mostly because really statistics change and they're difficult to communicate accurately. But roughly, um, you know, a, a total of maybe 40 mainstream brands and organizations control way over 90% of the market. So it is the entirety of the fashion industry that needs to be addressed. You know, um, they each, both the luxury sector and the cheap sector have big responsibilities and they're very different. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know that fast fashion is just producing an insane amount of clothing that we will never ever need and unfortunately we've been conditioned to thinking that cheap clothes are so badly made that we should mend them that's really wrong everything is mendable everything is repairable in fact when you take your average fast fashion piece it's made so simply that frankly my cat could repair it if the hemline of a skirt drops. And I very much believe that fast fashion stores have an obligation to put cheap repairs 
into their flagship stores so that you know if you want to buy a cheap product it should be just as cheaply repaired but you know the ultimate goal is people and the nature that we all share and you know the luxury sector doesn't necessarily pay their supply chain workers a fair and dignified wage and if they do they're not communicating it so we don't know so I can't say I trust them to do the right thing and really pay is fundamental because the people who make our clothes whether they're making beautiful designer clothes or you know something designed to just be worn for a fancy dress party it's still people making those clothes and I want to share my respect to them because these people are very often exploited very often working in dangerous situations unheard and in countries that are so far away from where I am that it would be so easy for me to pretend that these people didn't exist in the first place while on the other hand I want to share and honor their toil honor their hardship and I can only do that by keeping those clothes so whether I know that designer clothes, obviously people keep it longer, but there is so many different things that we need to analyze about the fashion industry overall. And for me, the most important thing is that in looking for solutions, in looking for a fashion that really addresses the future that we are all going to be facing together, we need to make space. We need to make space for those people we haven't heard from. And in many cases, those are supply chain workers very clearly telling us we are struggling. It's a humanitarian crisis in those factories where people aren't paid. And it's not just cheap fashion that produces those in those factories. So that's the first thing. And then the other thing is that I want to showcase these designers all over the world that actually are finding those little solutions and for me mainstream fashion cheap fashion luxury fashion high street or high end have an obligation to help us hear those voices hear those stories and buy a fashion that is produced differently for the future really that is really true i love that because it's very very true we don't see the damage or the pain that other people, which you said, are far exactly. away from us. We just don't see their own struggle, their pain of the constant working hours because we want a product on our table. We want to fit into a society, which we now need to change. But don't you think now we've got to that stage where we now also need to put you, um, to educate the consumer side, the people buying these products. Because I know, for example, myself, I, I worked one of your, your talks and you asked a valuable question. You said, oh, how many of us really think about what we put on? What, you know, the process, the logistic process. I, I, I tried to answer that question before having this conversation with myself. I said, I buy all these things, but I never ever think about the logistic side. Where does my clothes come from? The only thing I think about is how good does it look? How does it look on me? Absolutely. Yeah. And how can we change that mindset? Well, I think that there are several ways, okay? And, and one of them is, you know, we do need to keep ourselves informed. And the reality is that we've seen it happen with food. We've seen it happen with beauty. I mean, these are industries that are, uh, to a certain extent, some more than others, but regulated. Um, it's understood that what we put inside our body has an effect on our health. And guess what? The skin is the second most absorbing organ on our body. And yet we don't know what we're putting on our skin because the fashion industry has no obligation to give us that information. So we could be wearing dyes that are not only carcinogens to our own skin but once we care and wash for this product we actually are transmitting all of this toxicants onto public waterways and therefore within our communities let me just give you a really simple example polyester polyester is 
used for blended with cotton for just about every single sportswear, leotard, you know, sweatpants, all of those are made with polyester. Now, polyester sheds invisible microfibers. These microfibers are primarily shed when we wash polyester and they've been found at the very, very bottom of the ocean and at the top of Mount Everest. Unfortunately, it's been discovered that these microfibers are now in our bloodstream. Now, I'm not saying that all plastic mi microfibers come from polyester because apparently the majority do come from, say, tires, you know, the, the impact of tires on streets and so on and so forth. But we know that polyester has a massive impact when we breathe it, when we wear it. What a contradiction that our sportswear, which we're meant to be wearing in nature, harms nature. And how can we think differently? Well, if I'm going to buy polyester, I'm going to buy an overcoat. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make it recycled polyester, and I'm not going to shove it into the machine every other day, am I? I'm going to, you know, maybe sponge clean it. So to really minimize that damage. But what I really would like to connect, particularly with your massive audience, is maybe a little bit for the future. So my example always is, we used to shop in stores. That was it. We had no other alternative. You know, maybe there was a catalog or two. When we started shopping online, we really had to change our mindset. We really had to do a process of, okay, guys, this is different, totally different journey. We now need to do that when it comes to that point of purchase. So you're looking for a pair of jeans. You are a size 12. Okay, with that size 12, I want to know also the size of the pay of the person or the people who made those jeans. You're looking for a bright pink t-shirt. Okay, for that bright pink t-shirt, I don't wanna see whether it's fuchsia or pastel that I'm looking for. I want you to think, to look for those toxicants that are inside that t-shirt. So I want to ensure that the brand tells me what it was dyed with, what is it made from. Only then can we say, that the brand's customers are allowed to make decisions that are informed. And by informed, I don't just mean the selfishness that I mentioned before around you know, the skin absorbing the toxicants. What is good for people and what is good for nature? Because ultimately, we are affected by all the people and we are all inhabiting the same nature. So this information is selfish because it will protect my family from wearing clothes that are toxic but it's selfless because it will protect my community after me when I care for those clothes and as I said before ultimately the people who are responsible for making them yes also that's, that, that is so on, on point because I think we need to start with ourselves then we go to our family, then we go to our community, because the more more people think about this, the more people start understanding, okay, I'm getting this. What is it that the person at the end stream of the logistic chain is actually getting from this? You know, okay. all of your amazing work, right? There must've been lots of pushbacks and non-acceptance of your ideas on sustainability. Because I, I, I can only imagine so many people who will benefit from that, um, that side where they pay cheap because it's easier than they make a huge profit margin for the organization. The pressure, how are you being able to overcome those obstacles from this, your, from your message? Well, um, let's put it this way. I am really headstrong and I am really patient. So it's a combination of those two. I mean, you know, as far as I'm concerned, my obligation is to leave a better world for my children than the one that I came in always. I mean, that is principle number one of human evolution. You know, you improve, you have to improve. So improving for me is, is a, it's a pretty important thing to do. I don't take improving lightly in any way, shape or form. So 
for every pushback that I have received, I've opened a door for someone else. Yeah. That's the only way that you're going to keep carrying on because a door closed in your face is incredibly painful, demoralizing, terrifying. And the only way that you will make sense of it is to use that pain, that fear, and that demoralization in order to ensure that it's the same thing isn't happening to somebody else. This is why for me, um, mentoring and giving an opportunity to other uh, designers, creators and thinkers is the most important part of my career. I do it for, I'd say 90% of the time, completely for free uh, because the people that I choose to mentor really can't afford mentoring which is why I want to mentor so you know I do things like um, I started Patreon in order to be you know to, to argument my own you know uh, earning potentials in many ways because I genuinely genuinely believe that the only thing that keeps me me alive and sane mentally is to give back. Mm, that's really amazing. From your deep experience, how have producers and retailers of fashion make a difference in reducing the amount of resources they're using? You know, because you've really, you're championing, how, how are you seeing any difference being made? Well, it's very different if you are a very large brand or if you are a small brand. I mean, you know, the young brands that I mentor, it's very easy to get them to completely optimize their resources. We don't even talk about sustainability. We talk about efficiency and common sense. Those are the only two words I bring in when I mentor, because it is about knowing who made your clothes. It is about knowing that you're paying the people who made your clothes it is about buying the best possible fabric for yourself and for nature buying a fabric that will use that lasts a long time that you can use it again and again that's upcycling so all of these technical terms like circularity upcycling sustainability i i use that the you know their equivalent but in a normal world not in a kind of disciplinary type way so that's the first you know the the the, the first element really of of this conversation with them and i also believe that you know that the most important thing really is to um provide the agency so that there is this courage to want to go through and believing that making mistakes is an incredibly important part of the conversation. I mean, you know, if, if you were to listen to all the big brands that have been doing sustainability, you'd think that they never made a mistake in the last 20 years. Well, they have, and we grow from mistakes. So honesty, again, is a, is a really, really important uh, element. And radical transparency. I mean, you know, we need to know where things are made and what they contain. And this industry, believe it or not, people tend to think of fashion as a modern industry, an industry, it's the most old fashioned industry that there is. It hasn't pretty much redesigned itself since industrialization. It's still following those same colonial roots that were in place three, two, whatever hundred years ago, still working on, you know, those types of principles and and operations so it is an industry that really would benefit and will benefit from big changes like that what is an upcycling close uh, because you, you talk about it what does it mean and why is it important for sustainability so upcycling is the kind of the creative way to readapt and reuse and it can take any form i mean i've upcycled huge tons of materials in in my career uh, working with brands such as Topshop, FNF Tesco clothing, um, Speedo, you know these are brands that have massive excess of both materials and unsold clothing. So upcycling would be really transforming them into something else. Mm -hmm. um, it can be done with fabrics uh, like excess stock, excess fabrics. It can be done with bits on the floor, but it's basically quite immediate. Recycling, on the other hand, is a either chemical or a mechanical process by which 
the fibers are recuperated and returned into another form of yarn. But that is, you know, it, it's slightly more complicated. Upcycling, really, mm. there should be an upcycling line in every factory and oh. upcycling is also something that should be taught at school it's very easy I mean you know there's only so many things that you can do with a pair of jeans but if you did them then that pair of jeans would last another 10 years I have to ask you the difficult question which is about the mindset right so try to you need to, to to adapt to this as much as we target the organizations we also have to target the society the individuals in this part of it how can we shift behaviors that where consumers like myself value their clothes and think of it longer. You know, even though it's a fast clothes, even if it's something, though you, something you bought cheaply, you can still think of it longer term. How can we do it, adapt that? It needs to be a collaboration between brands and consumers, and we do need to meet halfway because I do believe that brands have um, somehow uh, dragged us uh, with this constant change and, and trends and, you know, drops and, you know what I mean? It's like, but who's going to say no to constant cake? Yeah. You know, is anybody going to say no to constant cake? Would I say no to constant lipstick? Never. So, of course, we've succumbed to this because we weren't ever given the truth. So once we know the truth, we can all find what's right for us. And that's fundamental to changing mindset when it comes to fashion because fashion is individual we all have a different style so you need to find what really matters to you so i have um shameless self-promotion but this is my book it's called loved clothes last and it was published by penguin life and it basically advocates about starting in your own wardrobe telling yourself stories about the clothes that you have but you do need to make an effort to begin with to change that mindset but you know what it's not about going on a diet it's not about depriving yourself it's not about going on a okay no more a boycott or anything like that it's about looking at your clothes and rediscovering that love that passion that why did you buy them in the first place and then you can construct yourself all sorts of really useful games so you know mending for instance my book talks a lot about mending now you know what i hate mending i'm not anywhere near good at mending as say my daughters are so i give work to other people who come and mend my clothes and it's a very dignified job and i pay an awful lot but i still pay less than if i was buying the or well, sometimes actually i pay more than if i was buying them new but they're unique so they are priceless because every tear is your tear. Every tear is your story. So if you start looking at your clothes as your possessions, which they are, and if you know that you have to be responsible for your possessions, because once they are no longer your possessions, they could have a damaging effect mm -hmm. on nature and on people then I suggest that's your first starting point. Make it your style. Make keeping your style. And then remember one thing. That is what trends are about. Why do we look at influencers? Because we admire what they do. And then what do we do? We copy them. So if you look at your wardrobe every day with a sense of enthusiasm, if, if you find what works for you in terms of restyling, rewearing, sharing, borrowing, lending, mending, all of that world, and you do it with joy, you do it with panache, you do it with excitement, people will follow you, people will copy you. That's and true. that's the start. Uh, actually, talking about your book, that was something I was going to ask you on just now before I get to my final question. You, in 2021, you launched your book, Love Clothes Lost. And, you know, this book talks about how the joy of rewearing, repairing your clothes can be reversed. Like, you know, we, we could change our act. We could see things differently by that. And when, you, when, I, look, when I look at your book, because I, 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 I read some synopsis about it, and I realized it's all about, it's almost like you go for surgery 
and you're so damaged, you're so distraught, distraught by the scar that surgery will leave, will leave you. But then you remember that this surgery is just a part of your journey. It's part of who you are. And it's something that your book also emphasizes that it shares this important message that it doesn't matter what's happened. You, this pieces, this clothing, are all investment piece, you treat them differently, even if something goes wrong with it, look after them, make your own piece unique, tailor it. Anyone who hasn't read your book and wants to get a copy, how can they get your copy of your book and where? Tell me key messages that anyone who's reading your book will learn from your book. So um, I, I think you can find it online. I'm not going to say the dreaded name, but you can also find it in bookshop, bookstores. It is Penguin Life. So it's a, it's a big publisher. So it's, it's quite easy to find. It was translated also in Italian and English I don't, uh, in, and French. Sorry, I don't know how far your audience goes. But I think what's important about this book is that it balances the concept of repairing clothes and also wanting to repair the system. And... This is the impetus, you know, because ultimately just repairing our own clothes leads to, yeah, a better managed wardrobe. But yeah. if you start bringing this message, <coughs> excuse me, into the community, if you start thinking about putting questions out there, like why is fast fashion so cheap and why if it would be so easy to repair it, why aren't the stores giving me an opportunity to make these clothes last longer? And, you know, all sorts of questions like the one I mentioned before, what we're putting on our skin. I mean, what I want my um, uh, reader to, to, to discover really is that sense of agency and that sense of enthusiasm of being able to do it themselves. And above all, to know that it matters, that it really, really matters. That's really amazing. A final question before I let you go. I know how busy you are. From a young girl sketching to a noted fashion designer now, and not just that, to someone really teaching us the mindset of sustainability, the reason why we could reuse our clothes, how to do it, teaching young people talent, what continues to bring you joy in the fashion industry today? Um the the designers that I mentor because they're not just designers of clothes they're designers of systems they're designers of new way of thinking um, I feel like a vampire half the time because although I am their mentor oh god I learn so 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 much from them they come from all walks of life and from all over the globe I'm really actually I'm uh, you know I am the mentor I mentor for talent but I really mentor where I believe that I can open that door that was often um, shut in my face. Um, and students and their motivations. Really, this is 100% um, my future. It's of course, it's the future of everybody else's, mm -hmm. but I am honored and um, always deeply, deeply excited to be able to have these conversations mm -hmm. and to be on impact to others that will have to walk this journey after me. I'm really honored to have you today because I've just, I myself have learned so much. I just imagine how much others would have learned by listening to this conversation about how we should think about clothes, the logistic point of view, the value, and also how we can make our old clothes new. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for inviting me and keep following fashion revolution keep following myself and i look forward to to meeting more people from your community and you again thank you so much Anne, absolutely for having me. thank you so much. i really appreciate this thank you so much for your time